There are two working equations that describe the propagation of paraxial rays through an optical system. At any surface, refracted and reflected rays follow a path described by this variation on Snell's law, which is written in terms of the angle relative to the optical axis rather than the angle relative to the surface normal. And although this is Snell's law, there's no trigonometric function because the small angle approximation of the paraxial limit is maintained here as long as the angle is in radians. Between interfaces, a ray follows a straight line path, so the simple equation of a line describes the transfer of a ray from one surface to the next. It's useful to write these equations in matrix form. Click here if you'd like more than this cursory review about how that's done for refraction. In this video, I'll show you how it's done for reflection. Refraction at a dielectric interface is described by this 2 by 2 matrix where phi is the refracting power of the surface. Conveniently, the refraction matrix for a thin lens, then, is of the same form, where the power is the inverse of the lens's focal length. The transfer matrix is another 2 by 2 that includes the distance t that the ray travels. The prime on the refractive index n is specific to this diagram where the ray propagates the distance t through a glass of refractive index n prime. No matter what, the index used here is the index of the medium through which the ray transfer is happening. With the surface equation and the transfer equation pairing up to be written in matrix form, the corresponding vector describes the ray angle and the ray height, and is called the ray vector, here referred to with the little r. The 2 by 2 matrix A includes all of the refractions, reflections, and ray transfers from one end of the optical system to the other, with r being the incident ray vector, A operating on the incident ray vector, producing the output ray vector, r prime. The form of the 1 by 2 ray vector uses the product of n and u as the top entry and ray height as the bottom entry. At this point, it's important to note that there are multiple ways to put two independent equations with two unknowns into a matrix equation. Some authors put the transfer equation on top and the surface equation on the bottom. Different textbooks leave the refractive index entirely inside the matrix. And there are also various sign conventions out there, so don't be too surprised if you see the reflection matrix published elsewhere with some minus signs. I'll explain the sign conventions that I'm using as I go along, beginning with the sign convention of the ray angle. This is by no means the only sign convention out there, and not even the only sign convention used throughout all my videos. Oops. I adopted this from Pedrati, Pedrati, and Pedrati because it keeps the matrix setup simple and, as I hope you see, minimizes confusion. So let's construct the reflection matrix. If a ray encounters a mirror and reflects, the mathematical description goes like this. An incident ray vector, R, is operated on by a matrix, M, producing an outgoing ray vector, R prime. Writing this out explicitly, the ray vector components are N, U, and Y. I'll just write the matrix elements as A, B, C, D, and leaving the next question being what are A, B, C, and D. Well, look at the bottom equation in the matrix, which provides more description than is actually necessary. Now you see, y1 equals y2. That is to say, reflection happens at a point, and there's no actual ray transfer. But nevertheless, the transfer equation holds. So what do you do? You choose the coefficients c and d so that y1 ends up equaling y2. Now to come up with the other two coefficients, a and b, special conditions of ray incidence are helpful. A ray incident parallel to the optical axis will pass through the focal point after reflection. Depending on whether the mirror is concave or convex, either the real or virtual reflected ray will pass through the focal point. Here a concave reflector is shown, so the real reflected ray is seen passing through the focus. Something to note about a concave reflector is that its radius of curvature is a negative number, and thus the focal point is a distance negative r over 2 from the mirror vertex. Because the ray is incident parallel, the incident ray angle u is 0, 
and from the top equation in the matrix with u equal to 0, n prime u prime equals b times y sub 1, where y sub 1 is the ray height at reflection. Inspecting the right triangle that gives this relationship between u prime and y sub 1, the only possibility is that b is 2 n prime over r, the radius of curvature. A ray that is incident at the vertex will reflect with the same angle relative to the optical axis as it approached with. So in this case, u prime equals u, and furthermore, the vertex y sub 1 is 0. This condition simplifies the top equation down to two terms, and a must be unity. The condition does include the refractive index, but n and n prime are the same in reflection, so they simply cancel. And by setting the equations up this way, the sign convention where a refractive index is not negative for a reflected ray is put into force. Now the reflection matrix is known and is listed here along with the refraction and transfer matrices. I'll use a simple system with a lens and a mirror to demonstrate how these matrices are used as operators on a ray vector. I'll build out the equation down here at the bottom where an incoming ray vector R is operated on by a combination of these matrices resulting in an outgoing ray R prime. The matrices R sub 1 and R sub 2 describe refraction at the front and back surfaces of the lens respectively, with the matrix T sub 1 describing the transfer of that ray through the lens and T sub 2 the transfer of the ray to the mirror, where the reflection then is described by the matrix M. The first thing that happens is refraction at the front surface. The matrix R sub 1 operates on the incoming ray to produce the ray that propagates through the lens, where the next thing that happens is the transfer through the lens. Then the ray refracts at the back surface. So this matrix R sub 2 operates on the vector that was generated by applying the matrix R sub 1 to vector R and then matrix T sub 1 to that resulting vector. Matrix T sub 2 takes that ray all the way to the mirror, where the matrix M operates on it as it reflects back. Again, carried by matrix T sub 2 to the lens, where it refracts on the back surface, transfers through the glass, and then refracts at the front surface, producing the outgoing ray R prime. The product of all of these 2 by 2 single matrices can be written as a single 2 by 2 matrix called the system matrix A. These four elements of the system matrix all have physical meanings, one of which I'm going to demonstrate to you in just a minute. You can use the system matrix elements to find the front principal plane relative to the vertex of the first element, and the back principal plane relative to the vertex of the final element. The effective focal length is minus 1 divided by element A sub 1, 2. With the effective focal length and the principal planes known, the back focal length and the corresponding front focal length can also be computed. Here's a simple explanation for why the effective focal length is minus 1 divided by element A sub 1, 2. This optical system has an incident parallel ray because the incoming ray is parallel to the optical axis, the outgoing ray proceeds to intercept the optical axis at the focal point. Extrapolate the incoming ray through the system, where y is the incoming ray height. Extrapolate the outgoing ray back into the optical system. The point where the two extrapolated rays intersect locates the rear principal plane. The effective focal length of a system is the distance from the rear principal plane to the focal point. The outgoing ray angle is easily identified with a right triangle in terms of y and effective focal length EFL, where the angle sign convention requires this minus sign. So I'll direct your attention to the matrix equation. The top equation is simplified if the incident ray angle is 0. With n prime equal to 1, Use the expression above for u prime, rearrange, and you have the result that the effective focal length is minus 1 over the element a sub 1, 2. 
A Cassegrain telescope has two mirrors which reduce the light filling the entrance pupil to a smaller beam suitable for introduction to an observer's eye. Light from a distant source arrives parallel to the optical axis. It reflects off the large concave mirror called the primary mirror and proceeds to the smaller convex secondary mirror. After reflecting off the secondary mirror, it then returns to the primary mirror. A hole in the center of the primary mirror allows this reflected light to be accessed by an observer. Because the secondary mirror already obstructs this portion of the primary mirror, the hole doesn't really affect the primary mirror's performance. The light passing out of the hole is diverging, but it needs to be collimated in order to be suitable for the human eye, and the job of the eyepiece is to send the rays out parallel to the optical axis. Now real eyepieces are compound lenses, but for simplicity here I'll use a single lens. An unanswered question is, given the focal length of this lens, where should it be positioned such that the outgoing light is parallel to the optical axis? In other words, where should the lens be such that this system is afocal? The outgoing ray R prime is the result of operation on the incoming ray R. The system matrix is found by first operating on the incoming ray with the reflection matrix for the primary mirror M sub 1. Then the ray is transferred to the secondary mirror by transfer matrix T sub 1 2. That ray is operated on by the reflection matrix for the secondary mirror and that result is operated on by the transfer matrix from the secondary mirror out to the eyepiece T sub 2 to E. When the ray that was generated by all these operators finally arrives at the lens, it's operated on one last time by the eyepiece refraction matrix R sub E. All of these matrices are written more explicitly here. It's a matter of algebraic busy work here to multiply them, and I'll leave that as an exercise to the student. So I went ahead and mashed these five matrices together, and here's the result. The system matrix for a Cassegrain telescope with a black box eyepiece of focal length f. The top right element is the one that we're interested in. If the lens is located in just the right place, then the outgoing beam is as parallel as the incoming starlight. And with parallel rays, the effective focal length is undefined. So element A sub 1, 2, which is minus 1 divided by the effective focal length, has to be 0. Let's make up some values for the radii R1 and R2, the mirror separation D1, and the eyepiece focal length F. Note that the primary mirror radius, R sub 1, is negative because it's a concave mirror. The distance D sub 2 is found by setting the system matrix element A sub 1, 2 to 0. If the lens isn't positioned at exactly that distance, then the outgoing light will either be converging or diverging. If it's at the computed distance, then the outgoing light will be collimated. Here the element A sub 1, 2 is written again and set to 0. The expression is solved for D sub 2. Values are plugged in. And now we know that the lens needs to be located 630 millimeters after the secondary mirror in order to be a focal. But I hate to put a problem on YouTube only to find that the answer is wrong. That would be embarrassing and those who have watched my other videos know that I benchmark everything. That is, if you compute something, there needs to be a reality check. Which can come in all kinds of forms and here I'll put the Cassegrain telescope into ray tracing software with one simple question. Is the output light collimated? So I downloaded the free demo of FRED in order to do some ray tracing analysis. FRED is well known for use in non-sequential ray tracing and I made use of that in order to benchmark the matrix calculations I just did. So I set up that Cassegrain style telescope in FRED. There is to the left the light source, and then the next item is the secondary mirror, and the next is the primary mirror, then the lens, and down at the right end is a detector where I will look at the light that's arriving at it. Just right of the lens I put another detector, and I'm going to look at the light there, and I'm going to compare those two detectors to ensure that what's coming out of the lens is collimated. So the primary mirror has a radius of minus 1200 millimeters. I gave it a 
radius of 80 millimeters, you might say, why not make it large like it might normally be? Because these matrix calculations are for paraxial rays only. And so I need to ensure that only paraxial rays are going in. I'm keeping the semi-aperture of the system small just so that everything is paraxial. And then there's the hole in the middle of the primary mirror with a 15 millimeter radius. The secondary mirror is 500 millimeters in front of the primary mirror, and it has a radius of 25 millimeters and a curvature of 300 millimeters. I will just use a single lens for the eyepiece. Of course, normally eyepieces are compound lenses. It's made from BK7. I kept the thickness as small as I can at 12 millimeters. Any smaller, and I have overlapping surfaces at the edges of the lens, so that's the minimum thickness there. It's equiconvex with the radius of curvature of 340 millimeters, and the radius of the lens itself, I just made 60 millimeters more than enough. I positioned that lens 630 millimeters to the right of the secondary mirror. 2,000 millimeters away from the secondary mirror is the final detector. I made the surface 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters square, and it's the final endpoint of the system, so I made it absorbing. Another detector right after the lens, I'm calling the lens detector, it's 650 millimeters to the right of the secondary mirror, so just past the lens and it's 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters in rectangular. I'm going to use it to view the shape of the beam as it leaves the lens and compare it to the shape of the beam at the far end detector. Each one of those detectors has a detector surface. The detector at the far end is a 40 millimeter by 40 millimeter square, as is the detector right after the lens. The mirrors are made out of aluminum, they have a coating that reflects 97% of the power. So I'll perform a ray trace just by pulling it down and trace and render, and we have our ray trace. The source to the left sends out a plane wave that's got all parallel lines to it. You can zoom in and look and see the parallel lines. I think I used 10,000 rays. Oh, 50,000 rays. There are a lot of rays. <laughs> Then there's the primary mirror, and the light reflects off the primary mirror. It hits the secondary mirror, reflects off of that. And you can see right about here is where the light reflecting from the secondary mirror reaches its focal point and comes out diverging, arriving at the lens, and then passing through the lens onto the detector at the end. And we will take a look at the irradiance pattern on the end. So each point on this diagram represents one ray arriving at the detector. The input beam had this radius of 80 millimeters, but coming out, it's been taken down to, oh, about 30 millimeters. It makes a definite circular pattern. I'll put a red circle around it to show the confines of the beam. And notice the axes. So I'm plotting from minus 20 to plus 20 on the x and y axis. If I look at the detector at the lens, I see a similar pattern, and again, a circle going around it is exactly the same. That's, in fact, the same circle. So this light is collimated. It has the same round radius coming out of the lens as it has 2,000 millimeters away. The irradiance pattern looks like this. You can see the secondary mirror obscuration in the irradiance plotted on the far end detector. Okay, so that was a simulation where I positioned the eyepiece 630 millimeters away from the secondary mirror, and I got collimated light coming out. Suppose I didn't put that lens 630 millimeters away. Suppose I put it 680 millimeters away, 50 millimeters more. Now it's noticeably converging. And if I put the lens 50 millimeters closer, that would be at 580, it's noticeably diverging. But at 630, which was calculated from the matrices to be the proper location of the lens in order to have collimated output, the output is indeed collimated. 